All right, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me here to talk. Um, so first, some disclosure. I, I have no financial relationship with any of the companies here, but I have been utilizing the Mako system, which is from Stryker. Uh, it's the largest of the uh, robotic systems currently in use. And I've, for about the past 18 months since we got it at our hospital, I've used it for probably 99% of the uh, primary hip and knee replacements we do. So we'll start off and talk a little bit about hip replacement first. Um, so hip replacement, our total hip replacement refers to resurfacing of the femoral and acetabular side of the joint. Uh, we replace this with uh, metal components. Uh, there are four components in a typical hip replacement with a metal femoral stem, metal acetabular cup, and then a plastic liner or ceramic liner and a ceramic or metal head on the femur. So the surgery takes uh, anywhere from one to two hours. And uh, with modern joint replacement techniques, as Mike just talked about, these are patients that are now, instead of staying in the hospital three to five days, are going home the same day. Um, it's a big important thing we've done is our, ther our therapists are now working with the patients the same day of surgery. And so often within a few hours at the hospital of a patient coming out of the operating room, our therapists have them up and moving in the um, halls. And that just helps the patient gain a little trust in that joint. And as we go to rapid discharge protocols, has been extremely important. Uh, patients have, are having a lot less pain because our pain controls have improved substantially. And we now send virtually every patient home. The days of patients going to a rehab facility for two to three weeks um, are kind of frowned upon as we found they had higher risk of uh, infection and readmission to the hospital. However, everything is not perfect. We still have complications. Dislocations happen. Components come out malpositioned, leg length discrepancies. Uh, components fail and loosen early. And then sometimes patients just have continued pain and bursitis. And we have to wonder if those are indirectly related to component positioning. So when we look at how we define excellence in any particular field, uh, Ted Williams, the last major league player to hit 400 for a season, and Steph Curry, a 43.7% career three-point shooter. These are the best of at what they do. They're at the top of their game. But I don't think anyone would be happy with an orthopedic surgeon who hit his target less than 50% of the time. But this is exactly what we were doing. So a study from Harvard with experienced joint replacement surgeons showed that when we were looking at our position of the hip, uh, the acetabular component, we hit the target 50% of the time. These are very good surgeons who do a lot of joint replacement, and most of these patients still did well, but as we're going forward and trying to look at better and better outcomes, we're going for more narrow targets, and we're trying to customize position of components to the patient instead of trying to make everyone fit a certain mold, and until we can reliably hit that target, we're not really able to advance forward. So the solutions that have come about are similar to what's been found in most industry um, and manufacturing is that employing computers and robotics to improve our accuracy and the reliability of our procedures. So there's currently numerous options out on the market. Uh, Mako is certainly um, the most prevalent, and I think there's like 50 or 60 Mako robots here in Florida alone. But Rosa from Zimmer, Navio from Smith & Nephew, Omnibot from Corin are all other options that are now, within the past year, really coming to, uh, to give some competition to Stryker. So as I said, I am a Mako user, so we'll kind of focus on that. But robotics in general has the same goals. I think the big uh, misconception a lot of my patients have is they've all heard about the uh, general surgeons and uh, uh, OBGYNs who are using uh, Da Vinci for robotic procedures, where there's a console over in the side of the room. The uh, surgeon is not actually physically touching the patient, and Mako is different, so I'm still performing the entire surgery. The robotic arm just helps guide my hands to make sure that the plan that I decided upon before surgery is the exact plan that's executed, and uh, it will not move without me doing so. So the day of me being able to sit in, a, in the lobby with a cup of coffee hasn't quite gotten here yet. Um, the process starts well before the patient ever enters the operating room. We get a preoperative CT scan, which helps us to know what the patient's anatomy truly is. That's our control. What we saw with computer navigation prior to this robotics is that we were feeding the robot uh, or the computer information. However, if the information was inaccurate, you would have an inaccurate result. We then are able to 3D um, plan the surgery before we ever step foot in the operating room. Interoperatively, we confirm anatomic landmarks to the CT scan to make sure that we have an accurate plan. And then the robotic arm aligns the, my hands for the preparation of the acetabular component. 
The hope, hope what we've proven is this does give us a more accurate component positioning. It gives me ability to make fine adjustments to the patient intraoperatively. And there's been some early studies showing improved outcomes and reduced amounts of dis, uh, leg leak uh, issues and dislocations. This is performed through any surgical approach. It's just a tool, it's not a procedure. So I do about 60% of my hips through an anterior approach and a, the others through a posterior lateral approach and do them all with the make a robot. Here's a little example of what it looks like when we're able to plan the surgery. This is done on a laptop prior to ever setting foot in the operating room. You can scroll through the 3D plan and see what the component looks like or look through a traditional CT view. We can change the sizes of the components. We can anticipate if the patient had previous hardware or they have a large uh, periacetabular cyst and adjust the components to uh, make our component fit better, make our surgery go more smoothly. So we're trying to move from a reactionary standpoint to a predictive standpoint and kind of anticipate any potential problems before we ever step foot in the operating room. During surgery, I use a pointer to tell the computer where the anatomy is. Those are the green dots. The computer then gives me the blue dots, which I have to pop within uh, less than a millimeter of accuracy. And that is how we've confirmed that we have the correct plan. The computer knows where the anatomy is and we can go forward with the surgery. The robotic arm comes in across the patient and there are two screens. The screen in the bottom right corner is the one the um, rep uses to run the robot. And then I would be looking at the one that's facing away from us. But it gives us the alignment of the acetabular component as we're reaming. So we're reaming in the same exact place that we're going to put the component to the same exact size. The component that is put in, and it's within a few degrees of uh, the plan. Post-operative x-rays are no longer a surprise. Before this, you know, one out of 100 may not look what you thought it would look like, and that really uh, bothered me. As a joint surgeon, we all tend to be uh, pretty much a perfectionist, and you want to know that you're going to have a perfect outcome when the patient leaves the operating room. So looking back at that study from Harvard, 50% success rate. The same study was repeated with the Mako robot and so they were able to put the cup in the um, correct position 100% of the time. This group did do better with their conventional methods of 80% success, but still 20% success, more success putting the component where we want to put it with the robot. So a few case examples. Um, these, the robot has really made difficult cases uh, much easier and less stressful for me. This is a 74-year-old male who had had a history of cancer and had radiation to the pelvis. Uh, he had developed avascular necrosis and had lost almost his entire femoral head. He had a large leg length discrepancy. When this patient came into the office, he had gone from being a very active, healthy man to being bound to a wheelchair. He was in tremendous pain, unable to do any of the activities he previously enjoyed. And with the Mako robot, we were able to replicate the leg lengths, get the cup in in a great position. I used a couple screws because of the previous radiation just to add a little extra fixation. But this patient within two weeks was transitioning off the walker back to normal activities. He's now back to enjoying life. So it's a patient who was really on the verge of uh, wasting away in a wheelchair who's now back in an active member of society. But it can even be used for much more complex cases. So this is a 45-year-old male who presented with uh, severe left hip pain. He has a history of hip, dislo of hip dysplasia with a high dislocation of his uh, left hip there. He had had multiple previous procedures as a child, but as dysplasia cases do, he now was really limited, unable to play with his children. Um, so this is, these complex cases are where it really comes to the importance of preoperative planning. So the CT scan gave me a great um, visualization of what we were looking at. The flat surface at the top is what we call the pseudoacetabulum. That's where his hip had been articulating for the majority of his life. But one of the things with dysplasia cases to be successful is I need to get the acetabular component back to where his natural acetabulum will be to give that couple the chance of lasting for the rest of his life. Prior to surgery, he had a long leg length dislocation, but you can see there we're moving the cup on the preoperative plan back to the native area of the traditional acetabulum. And it becomes a much easier execution. Uh, extremely happy with the cup position and we've restored our native um, hip height and we were able to do this without an osteotomy. Um, used a little different stem just because of his extremely uh, small acetabulum. 
So moving on to total knee replacements, again, about a, a one to two hour surgery. This is, uh, we use metal caps to resurface the femur and the tibia. There's a plastic liner that goes in between, plastic or metal uh, back plastic liner that goes on the back of the patella. Traditionally, we have done this with an intramedullary guide rod in the femur. Uh, this was generally then cut, the femur was cut at a standard angle. Introducing a, rod, a guide rod into the femoral canal uh, led to increased blood flow and was less accurate. The margin of error of these uh, more traditional instrumentation has been shown to be at least three degrees. And when we had a three degree margin of error, we had to shoot for a more uh, standardized target to avoid having extreme outliers that would lead to early failure of the implants. Here's an example of what some of these uh, instruments looked like. The saw was then used by hand through these small um, cutting slots. And you know, with these implants, a lot of times we were kind of cutting the femur in the same way, or cutting the bone in the same way every time, and then adjusting the ligament as tension to make the knee be balanced and fit well. So we were, in, a, in essence, making the patient's body fit what the implant wanted to be instead of trying to customize the position of the implant to what the patient's body wanted. Preoperatively, we were able to know exactly what size implants we're going to use. We can see how the bone is going to fit or how the implant's going to fit the bone, how much uh, we're going to need to take from each area. We register the bone intraoperatively. These, uh, the blue um, object in the scrub tech's hand there with those little reflective discs is how the computer sees what we're doing. That is, we use that to point to the bone and uh, confirm these landmarks. And then where total knee really is a powerful tool is before we make any cuts, we can test the ligamentous tension that the patient's knee has and then adjust the position of the implants within small degrees of acceptable alignment changes to balance those ligaments out without having to go in and release the ligaments. The saw then positions itself in air and aligns itself for the cuts. I watch it on the screen to see the saw passing through. This is a little bit what that screen looks like. The outlines protect the MCL, the, P, or the lateral collateral ligament, the PCL, and then also the patellar tendon. So we're able to, we've been able to show that this has decreased uh, soft tissue injury, decreased complications, and we make a very accurate cut because the saw blade is thicker than a normal saw blade and doesn't have the same tendency to bend when it encounters hard bone. And we've been able to use this to tackle some really complex cases. So this is a 62-year-old guy who had had this tibia fracture 50 years ago. He worked as a, um, in tile his entire life. The fracture he had lived well with. He then suffers another tibial plateau fracture, which was uh, fixed in place and failed. And then the patient developed severe knee pain. He had no knee pain, or he had no pain from that tibia deformity, and it had functioned well his entire life. However, the knee is now causing the problem. He can't work. So our options when we look at this patient are, he has a severe deformity. It would be very difficult to align this with traditional tools, but to fix that deformity would be a very involved procedure. You, you or usually would use some type of external fixation device with slight correction over time. It can take a year. Having pins in the body for a year, high chances of infections, that can compromise his ability to have a total knee replacement in the future. And one of my trauma partners and I had talked this over at length about whether that was the best option for this patient. But in that time, he's not working for a year. He's you know, living off disability, and I think it becomes less and less likely he'll get back to work. However, due to the robot, we're able to very um, closely plan this uh, surgery. He had a large defect on the inside of the knee, so we're having to decide how are we going to compensate for that defect. And here I was able to see that I could actually use a smaller tibial component, take out some of that extra bone to help balance the knee better and not have to use as much metal. Um, you can see that defect here, there's a flat surface and then we're missing about a third of the tibia. And so when we got intraoperatively and went to uh, balance his ligaments, he had extreme uh, tightness along the medial side, um, which to release completely would probably end up leaving the uh, MCL deficient and a knee that would fail. We were able to take out this extra bone along that side, get the knee well balanced, 
and give this gentleman a knee within an acceptable mechanical axis so that he will be able to hopefully use this for many years. It's still, time will tell if this was the right surgery for him, but he walked 500 feet the day of surgery. The next morning he asked me when he could go back to work. And so, you know, I think getting this person back to normal activities will hopefully stand and be the, uh, the best thing for him in the long run. Not every patient is complex, though. Sometimes it's a straightforward patient. This is a 52-year-old year active male, no past medical history. He is very, very active, is a competitive bowler, uh, but has developed severe arthritis, which limits his ability to do what he enjoys. This was a more straightforward uh, procedure. We did a, a re relatively standard total knee, used a cementless component because of the very accurate bone cuts. I feel more comfortable doing cementless components, which hopefully will translate to a longer lasting implant for this gentleman. He was done as an outpatient in our hospital. Um, and here he is at his two week visit and really has no limp. And he actually went and bowled that night. So clearly, you know, this by adjusting the components to fit his body, he's had a great outcome. To be fair, he would probably have a great outcome no matter what. He is a top-notch patient, and I think patients have a lot more to do with our outcomes than we do at times. So the robotic knee platform has only been out for a few years now, and so the research is just now catching up. But this is a study out of uh, England, a uh, guy, Ferris Haddad, who's doing a lot of research on it. And they did a um, study comparing it to their conventionally jig-based total knee uh, system and found that these patients were having reduced post-operative pain, decreased uh, pain medication requirements. They had less blood loss because they weren't instrumenting the femoral canal. They had return of quad function more quickly, were able to use less PT um, sessions and had more uh, knee flexion at discharge. So it's an early study, but we're seeing that hopefully using these advanced tools can help us have better outcomes. And so that's what, exactly what we're hoping. Better outcomes, less pain, faster return to activity, fewer complications, having a more accurately placed implant that will last longer. And in the end, what we all care about is just having happier patients. Thank you.